So here we are again, another great pedestrian adventure. Today we're going to be talking about how those that are in Christ have crucified the uh, flesh with its passions and sinful desires. And uh, one of the things we want to keep in mind here when we read and, and uh, understand such scripture is that the passions here and, and the sinful desires, the lust of the flesh, uh, those things are obvious, the scripture says. You know, it's things like sexual immorality, uh, witchcraft, debauchery, uh, things that are, are very, very profound. This is not to say, for example, that if you um, have a situation where you have a eating disorder that uh, you know you don't belong to Christ it's not necessarily to say that uh, sometimes people get into situations where they have a lot of lust of the flesh you know and uh, maybe maybe they're struggling with that maybe they're they're having some issues with sexual immorality in their life uh, with those desires and uh, you know this is not to say that if you have such things that you don't belong to Christ and so just give it up it's not saying that it's not saying that but uh, what it is saying there is that uh, you know if, if you have some of those issues I mean there's some things to, to address certainly and and uh, you know one of the one of the things to note here is that if you're in a state of repentance where you're you're praying you're praying for repentance daily um, you know you're you're praying for for forgiveness daily you know, you're uh, you're constantly seeking seeking to get out of the sins that so entrap you then you know you're on the right course the people that are not on the right course are going to be those that that are glad for their sins and, and uh, promote them and and try to get other people to do the same uh, that is that is not the right course at all and uh, I know today and in, in today's world there's a lot of sin out there I'm going to I'm going to make clear I know like in high school for example it's real easy to get into a situation where a lot of young people they, they get together in, in one big uh, building and and maybe all they talk about is is uh, sexual immorality all day long and uh, you know you get some really perverse sort of sort of uh, belief system that maybe the students hold in common as a result of that and uh, you know where where it's, it's something that is detestable to God but if you belong to Christ, I mean, you've crucified the, uh, you know, you've crucified the flesh with its uh, sinful desires, and and you've you know done away with a lot of those things there. And but there's a sense in which, if you are struggling and and you have some sinful uh, desires and in your life, that's not to say you should give up. It's not to say that that somehow you belong to the devil and and just to give up. Uh, that's where you know prayer. I mean, you pray to God to lead you out of sin, temptation, deliver you from evil. Prayer, especially in the moment of those those sins and temptations, uh, makes a big difference. And uh, you know, the more that you pray, the more that you earnestly desire. Uh, to be to be united in the body of Christ uh, and 
sort of perfect harmony, the better off you're going to be. You know, I know that uh, it's really easy to get into a situation where where there's there's a lot of uh, dissension, you know, where there's a lot of a lot of evils that occur, and uh, it's really easy to get into a situation where where you know, we look at the world today and, and we we find that uh, you know there's there's nothing but evil, and uh, you know it's hard to to be good, godly, and righteous sometimes. And this is something I understand. I mean, one of the things to note here too is that when we look at the New Testament, when it talks about such matters, like we're in a situation where one of the things we might not fully realize sometimes is that the New Testament churches that St. Paul was dealing with especially, they had a lot of people in them that were like new converts to Christianity. A lot of those people were people that uh, they were maybe from a very pagan background. And some of those people, they had many wives and uh, there, there was a situation where they were not cultured a lot of times like the uh, the Jews were. A lot of the the synagogues that St. Paul went to, they had rejected the gospel of Christ, and and so that's why he eventually St. Paul went to the Gentiles and he preached the gospel to the Gentiles, and so some of the uh, some of the people there in the Gentiles, they didn't just have many wives, but they also had some some real serious stuff going on there. And uh, you know, it, it's uh, the, the sins can be pretty extraordinary, and that's where when we when we look at the situation where Saint Paul is saying, "If you belong to Christ." You know, you've crucified these things. I mean, you have to keep into a mind that that a lot of these people were not real cultured and and uh, understanding what a sin is. Even sometimes, you know, they they weren't. You know, they they understood that through the the work of the Holy Ghost, but it was the case that. They weren't developed like like um, the, the Jews of the time to to be people that were really observant in in the commandments of God. And so, when the situations like that, like Saint Paul is dealing with some real real serious stuff there, and you know, like when these people are getting into drunkenness and and orgies and, and the whatnot, and uh, and so he's addressing it, and he's saying, hey, you know, if you belong to Christ, you've crucified the flesh. I mean, he's dealing with with some of that that grave, grave sin, and especially if those people are are wanting to promote that as a as a lifestyle to to uh, practice. For everybody to practice, you know, which is something that should never be done. You know, I know that there was a situation in one of the one of the early churches there where there was a man who who slept with his his mother and was proud of it, and uh, you know that's where Saint Paul again he had to address the situation, and, and uh, you know there. I mean, it's some real serious stuff. Um, you know, those kind of people have to be separated from, you know, from the church. I mean, that they're, um, you know, uh, saved through through the destruction of the flesh, you know, and and uh, maybe handed over to Satan. 
for the destruction of the flesh so that the soul may be saved. I mean, and so, you know, you get into some of these, some of these real bad, real, real bad things that you read about in the scripture. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you see there is that, uh, like, in, in those churches and dealing with some of those things, I mean, it takes some real drastic actions and measures sometimes. Now, it's the case, though, that if these people that were having some of these issues with with serious sin, if they were in a state of repentance and they were, you know, they were like continually praying to be delivered from the evil, then, uh, you know, that's one thing. You know, that's something that, I mean, the church is there for people to be, to be delivered from their sin. And, uh, you know, that's why it's there. And, uh, and so, of course, you know, they're going to be able to, they're going to be able to partake in, uh, of the, the good things the church has to offer, uh, you know, when they're repentant of their sins and, and whatnot. But at the same time, Scripture makes clear that there are a list of people who will never inherit the kingdom of God. Um, you know, they'll, they'll never inherit. Um, they'll never inherit. And at the same time, if people have had some of those sins in their life, like the drunkenness and whatnot, I mean, that's where there's there's room for repentance you know so that it's like the saints weren't born saints but they became saints and so the idea here is that by by uh, you know repenting and and living a life of repentance that uh, it what it does there is is that God no longer considers us as uh, grave sinners, you know, because uh, God forgives us, uh, and especially with the absolution of sins, and, and uh, you know, when after after a person repents and they're absolved of their sins, and they're no longer considered to be uh, sinners, grave sinners, and so there's a lot of value here. And what the scriptures teach you know so that's where when we look at these things we should also keep in mind too that like when the scripture says if your eye causes you to sin gouge it out if your hand causes you to sin cut it off it's better to be in uh, heaven with one eye than hell with two i mean you know we don't want to interpret that real literally and start cutting body parts off. I mean, that's not the message here that we should take home with us. And, and that, that would be really bad if we did. But it's that crucifixion of the flesh, you know, that uh, for in Christ we've crucified the flesh with its sinful desires, the lust, as it were. Um, the crucifixion of the flesh. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that you you take uh, some nails like what Christ was crucified with and you start counting them in, you know, to your, your uh, arms and hands and stuff. That's not what it means. But what it means is to, is to, um, is to basically have those things put to death so that they don't continuously enslave a person. See, there's there's one there's one side of this here where where people can enjoy a good meal, you know, they can have some wine and they can have some some beer and maybe some hard liquor on occasion, um, you know, maybe at the end of a, a day. But to be enslaved by those things is another issue altogether, and that's what we don't want. We don't want to be enslaved by those things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing where, where a person is able to have a, a loving wife or they're able to have a loving husband 
and in a in a marriage where where it's a man and a woman and uh, they're able to to you know enjoy intimate relations with one another that's not a bad thing either you know that's not what scripture is condemning but uh, what scripture is condemning there is the, the orgies and, and everything else and that uh, that really really shows the lust of the flesh you know we we don't want to be in a situation where there's there's uh, all kinds of sleeping around so to speak where people are just are just uh, having intimate relationships sexual intimate relationships with whomever they please as often as they please and, and things of that nature that that's extraordinarily bad and that's where you really would see the um, the lust of the flesh and and that that would be something that would be really necessary to to uh, have crucified i mean if you're going to crucify the flesh you know that would be the time especially to do it and and uh, but uh, on the other hand it's uh it's not necessarily talking about uh not necessarily talking about if you let's say are hungry to go out to eat and and you go out to eat and and uh, and you know you spend a lot of money on that uh, sometimes people like to go out to eat and they spend some money and and you know that's good and godly per se uh, it gets to be a problem where a person is eating out every day and they can't afford it, you know, uh, or they're making huge sacrifices in their life and they're eating out every day, and and that's where the problem starts to emerge, and uh, you know, especially when they're when they're making sacrifices that ultimately maybe cannot be repaid. And that's what we want to try to avoid. We want to try to avoid those things. I know that, uh, I know it's real easy when you get company, for example, everybody wants to go out to eat and, and uh, you know, there's a huge bill and, and uh, you know, and, and you, you pay that bill. And, but that can be a good thing and not a bad thing. Um, you know, it, it, it's nice every once in a while to have company and and for people to love one another appropriately and and in Christ and and for good godly things to happen out of that and uh, for there to be a lot of grace as a result. Uh, now, it's a it's a bad thing if let's say people they want to eat out every day and you know you're getting the situation where all you're doing there is you're just you're just feeding their their you know lust of the flesh and and uh, every day you know you're eating out and and you know you're, it's not just at a fast food place but it's some place where hardly anybody could ever afford then that's where it can become kind of an issue there and and, and that's where you know, sometimes if, if uh, you know people are, are really are really pulling us into that we want to we want to you know tell them no you know we can't afford it uh, you know we want to we want to make clear that uh, it's just beyond our means now, if you are a rich person and you can afford to eat out every day and stuff like that, that's not a bad thing per se. But if you are a rich person, you can afford such things, then you don't want to be smashing down the poor and and treating people with contempt and that that have little or nothing and and uh, causing all kinds of grief for people because. Uh, 
as a result of their lack of resources and stuff because uh, that's not right especially if they're the people that work for you then that's even worse I mean and uh, you know you, you want to be you want to be gracious and, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you it's uh, it's always best if we can be a friend of the poor, I mean, that's, that's the best thing there. I know that uh, with the story of the, the poor man and Lazarus there, and, uh, or the, the, the rich man and Lazarus, I should say, not the poor man and Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus, that the rich man, you know, he was, he had this really nice place and and then uh, the poor man, he just was kind of like a beggar at the gate of the rich man's place. And, and the poor man, his only friend was a dog that would lick his sores. And the rich man and the poor man died. And, and then when the, when the rich man died, he went to hell. But when the, when the poor man died, he, he, uh, he went to Abraham's bosom, as it were, which is which is the, the better part of the afterlife there before uh, Christ had, had uh, uh, been crucified and risen from the dead. And so what happened there in that story is that uh, the, the rich man, he, uh, he suffered anguish and uh, the poor man, he had good things in his afterlife. Now, one of the things that we see there is that if the rich man had been a friend of the poor man, then none of that would have ever uh, needed to take place. That doesn't mean that the rich man would have to turn over all of his wealth to the poor man. Um, I know scripture, you know, Jesus says, uh, you know, sell all you have and come follow me. To some people, he does say that. I mean, and some of those people are people that maybe find themselves to be complete in their following of the, the law of Moses, that they, they find themselves righteous, that they diligently followed the law of Moses and and they're, they find themselves so righteous that that uh, that they find themselves to have no need for repentance at all, maybe, and, and that they're just able to come up to Christ and say, hey, you know, I'm just so righteous, and come on and accept me. And Jesus is saying, hey, man, you know, you lack something. And sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And... Uh, you know, some people, some people, Christ is, is maybe telling them that. I mean, on the other hand, you know, there might be some rich people out there that that uh, you know maybe maybe they know that they they've sinned and they've sinned and they've done wrong and and they see the need for for Christ and in their life and and just by being a friend of the poor man, I mean. They're able to, they're able to have, have salvation, you know. And maybe the poor man prays for him even. You know, maybe the, the rich man prays for the poor man. You know, maybe, maybe the, the rich man is able to help the poor man out, you know. And uh, maybe they're able to have, to have uh, a uniformity of will even. So it's not the rich man versus the poor man. So it's not the poor man begging at the rich man's gate and the and the rich man, you know, like booting him out there, keeping him out, you know, and and uh, you know maybe it's that the, the poor man's able to visit the rich man and the rich man's able to be happy and the poor man's able to be happy and that maybe they contribute to each other's lives and and uh, do all kinds of good things together. I don't know, you know and uh, mutually happy. I don't know. But uh, 
and we can see that there's there's a lot of room here in in freedom of, in price in in some of these things there's a lot of room for uh, there's a lot of room for freedom in price so that it's not it's not uh, it doesn't have to be uh, that that the rich man just gives everything to the poor man and, and uh, you know there, there can be some room here and one of the things that I want to look at here is that uh, a lot of this a lot of this uh, really depends on a lot of this really depends on how how much freedom we're we're looking at here. I mean, you know, we we certainly want to make sure that there's there's enough freedom that uh, you know we can be free, but we don't want to use that freedom as as like a a license to sin, so to speak. You know, we don't want to use that freedom as a justification for for sinning and doing great evil. I mean, so when we look at these things, I mean, like I say, there is a lot of room there for, for freedom. And really, the more freedom that we have in Christ, and in a lot of ways, the better off we can be. I mean, it's kind of like when we look at this river here. People can make all kinds of rules about the river, so many such that nobody could ever really enjoy it. You know, if if, um, if let's say the rules get so extreme that, that nobody's ever able to come in here and fish and they're never able to come in here and record and you know videos and they're never able to come in here and and even see it you know and and people pose it to be a danger because of this that and the other and then you know it gets to be the situation where if that happens then then people lose their freedom and and they're sort of kept from falling in that way and from drowning and, and from they're kept from all the evils that that could befall them if they if they you know like uh, were to get into the river. Uh, but the problem is that it it causes a situation where it really depletes the the joy in living. Um, the more that those things happen there, and some people. Some people, what they've done there is they've, they've taken like alcoholic substance use, for example, and they've kind of done that with that. And they've said, well, you know, you can't drink any alcohol at all or, or, or else, you know, you're out, you know. And, and, and uh, they, they basically cut those things out. Same way with uh, a lot of other things like firearms and, and uh, all kinds of things that that people would would find uh, joy in and uh, enjoy as part of recreation. And some people have said, "Well, you know, those things are just so so bad and and uh, such a bad thing for for a person and their salvation uh, that that they have to be done away with." And that's not right. That's not right at all. The problem with firearms is when you misuse them, and the problem with with liquor is when you misuse it. And the problem with with uh, you know the river here is, is when you misuse it. You know, it's, it's when people are suicidal and they jump in, and, and it's when uh, it's when people they they have no safety education at all, and and maybe they they decide they're going to do some crazy things and uh, especially when they're young you know uh, 
So you do have to be careful with some of these things and, and the things that God has given us. But that's not to say that they are utterly bad. You know, there's a time and a place for everything. Uh, there's a there's a time and a place to, to be sad and and to have joy and you know, there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. You know, there's a time for laughter. There's a time to cry. You know, there's there's a time for everything under the sun and a place for it. And, and we have to you know, we have to find that time and place. But some things, some things, uh, the center is so bad that it needs to be, it needs to be, um, the sinful flesh needs to be crucified and it needs to be eliminated from our life if we have those things. And, uh, you know, we want to belong to Christ and, and be in Christ and, and uh, be part of the body of Christ. And, and so if you hold out that hope, then uh, I'll tell you what, there's, there's the hope of salvation. But if you don't hold out that hope and, and you oppose, you know, the, the will of God and, and work against it, then, I mean, there's, there's not much hope. I mean, there's only, there's only hope in, if you come to repentance through a, through a miraculous event like what St. Paul did where he was on the road of, of Damascus there to crucify Christians and suddenly there was the great light and, and uh, the voice, you know, said, uh, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, oh, I didn't know it was you, Lord. You know, then that's, that's the only time then when there's hope of salvation in, in those situations where, where the sins are so grave that there's open opposition to the very will of God that, uh, you know, the, the uh, hope of salvation is through some miraculous conversion like St. Paul had, uh, which can happen, which can happen. You know, I know that, uh, I think there was a kid in my high school years ago, and I think he was one of the people that would always promote, uh, you know, the sin, uh, especially sexual sin. I think he was in junior high school even. And uh, you know, he was, he was like that to a great extreme. And, I think when, when I got into high school, I think he had some kind of miraculous conversion. It just didn't seem like the same guy at all. And, uh, you know, he, he changed entirely and, and became a completely different person. And that can happen. That can happen. It's, it's not like it can't because it can. But uh, that's where, if there are those kind of people that... Uh, sin exceedingly and, and they do it willfully and and uh, you know and, and they basically uh, um, eat one another as it were and, and they promote their sins and I mean it's possible it's possible believe it or not to, to pray for those people if they've done you wrong and uh, to pray for their salvation even and uh, you know they can be they can be saved just kind of like in the scripture there where uh, Stephen or Stephen he's, he's being stoned and and there's Saul who be, later became Saint Paul and and uh, he's at the stoning of Stephen or Stephen there however you pronounce it and so you know, Stephen Stephen he, he prays that the sin may not be held against them when he's being stoned. And, and then after that prayer, then sometime later, Saul, who later became St. Paul, became, became uh, miraculously uh, saved, you know, through, through having, having the, the revelation as to who Christ is, the divine revelation as to who Christ is being put into his life um, rather forcibly as it were 
and uh, you know, St. Paul was even blind for a time when, when that happened. And I mean, some of these things, some of these things happen. And uh, I'll tell you what, you know, we we want to be we want to be good and godly people. That's the, the purpose here is to be good and godly people to be to be right uh, in our ways to, to be uh, righteous in, in our in our doings and and uh, you know, not to miss the mark and. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to have faith stolen from us if we do miss the mark. You know, we, we want to we want to make sure to, to hold on to the faith and not abandon it because you know when we abandon it, then there's there's sometimes little or no hope on this. Uh, I mean, that's, you, you never want to abandon the faith, and no matter how bad things get. I mean, sometimes people, they make the, some bad choices in their life, and sometimes they do some bad things. But uh, don't abandon the faith. Uh, I mean, never abandon the faith. That's, that's, the, that's the fundamental, fundamental point to be made here, is never abandon the faith. I mean, you know, because when you abandon the faith, then, then what, what hope is left for salvation? I mean, really. And, uh, and that's where, that's where we, we want to maybe conclude today is, is uh, keep the faith, you know, you know walk in love. And uh, don't let anybody steal your joy. Uh, but crucify the flesh and its uh, lust and its sinful desires. And, uh, and that helps out a lot. Helps out a lot in being in Christ. And belonging to Christ. So God be blessed. God be praised. God love you, keep you safe always. Bye for now.